so before we kind of get into y'all's background a little bit, I want to talk about some of the themes that I think are going to come across in this panel. Um, so we're, we're, you know, the title of this is Energy Infrastructure is Necessary to Meet Demand. And I think what's interesting is, you know, what, what does demand mean? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very broad term. And what we're going to focus on today is, is really two things. The, the global population, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Tinker and others, are looking for safe, reliable, affordable, and secure energy sources. But on the other hand, there is also a huge demand for emissions reduction. And I think what we're going to talk about and what you're going to hear from these uh, panelists is that these companies, as well as many, other in, uh, many others in this industry, can do both of those things. And so, um, you know, natural gas is going to be a key driver in global decarbonization in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. can be the primary driver of doing it, and we can do it on a very uh, emissions-friendly uh, basis. So uh, from that standpoint, our perspective is that we need more pipeline and export infrastructure. Uh, not less. We need more infrastructure in CCUS uh, and, and not less. And so uh, I'm really excited about this discussion and kind of getting to hear from these folks. So before we get into the specific questions, I was, I was hoping um, maybe, we, and, and Matt, we can start with you and just kind of go down the row, that each one of you could just tell the audience about your background, how you got into where you are, kind of what you're doing now, uh, and then we can kind of get into more specific questions. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, as mentioned, I'm president and CEO of Producers Midstream out of Dallas. Uh, we were founded in 2006. Oh, yeah. Uh, get a little closer here. Better? There we go. There we go. We were founded in 2016 by industry veteran Jim Bryant, and uh, we signed later that year with Stevens Company Tailwater as an equity backer. And Jim initially asked me to join to run the commercial group, and I was fortunate enough to move into this role a few years later when Jim moved back to his current role as chairman. Uh, today, producers operates gathering and processing assets with about a billion cubic feet a day of total capacity, and we employ about 170 people statewide. Our assets are generally focused in the Permian Basin in West Texas and the Anadarko Basin up in the Texas Panhandle in western Oklahoma. For those of you unfamiliar with the GNP uh, vertical here, we're generally the front line of infrastructure out in the field with producers, gathering gas volumes at the wellhead. We then compress, dry, treat, and eventually process those volumes to remove natural gas liquids, sending the remaining gas downstream. Um, I got my start in the equipment side of the business, building a lot of the facilities and stations that we midstreams use here today. Uh, you know, unique to producers midstream being small and equity backed is we're able to control assets across multiple different basins. We've got two geologic areas that are very far removed from each other, actually both geologically and geographically. And we're able to connect those two via pipeline. We've got a very natural gas focused play up north in the Anadarko Basin. And we connect that via pipe all the way down to a really robust high growth kind of new exploration area in the Permian Basin. And that diversity allows us to really perform and grow under a wide variety of market conditions, but also it, it uniquely gives us access to multiple different downstream markets. And I think that connectivity and movement of hydrocarbons is, is really pivotal in a lot of the topics that we're going to discuss here today. So I look forward to digging in here. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Are we on? Yes. OK. Uh, Robin Fielder, I'm a petroleum engineer by degree, uh, but I've worn a lot of different hats, spent uh, a couple decades at Anadarko Petroleum, uh, doing all kinds of things upstream, but also working in the finance team, leading investor relations for some time. Um, and my last role there was, was running our marketing and midstream organization, including our midstream MLP, Western Gas Partners, and all Western Midstream Partners. Um, after the Occidental acquisition, I had a brief stint over at Noble Energy and Noble Midstream Partners, um, again playing pr pr uh, primarily in the uh, Permian and DJ basins with those assets, a lot of gathering and uh, processing facilities, uh, similar to what Matt was saying. Um, and then after the Chevron acquisition, decided I, you know, I really wanted to get into this energy transition space, ran into the Talos Energy Gang, actually at a conference, um, and kind of heard what they were doing and how they were leveraging their skill sets in uh, the subsurface being a conventional rock, meaning not 
uh, unconventional, um, not just the word conventional, but the true conventional geology. Uh, so Talos has been around just over 10 years now. Um, it and its predecessor companies have always focused along the Gulf Coast, and as the commodity shifted more in favor of crude, moved into the deeper and deeper waters. Um, so today, focused mostly in the deep water, uh, we closed a transaction earlier this year with another uh, deep water operator, Inven. Um, so we've got a pretty good footprint next, uh, next in line to a few of the majors that have the largest footprint offshore. Um, and what we're, you know, we really see ourselves as a good second owner of assets, and we can be good stewards of those. We can make sure that not just proper asset retirement obligations, but use, use data and technology to reprocess seismic, find additional resources around those facilities and that infrastructure, and develop it and continue to grow um, while we bring down the emission footprint. So it's, it's using that same skill set, that knowledge of the subsurface, and now applying that into sequestration you know, which is the last step of the, the CCUS value chain or the CCS value chain of, of capture, transport, and sequester CO2. And so we're building out a portfolio in that space as well. We've got four announced projects along the Gulf Coast, three in Texas, um, and we're the proud owner with our partners, Carbonvert and Chevron, of the first and, to date, only offshore lease for CO2 sequestration. It's in... Um, the shallow state waters offshore Jefferson County and uh, with the General Land Office of Texas. Awesome, thank you. So make sure everybody hears me this time. Uh, so Jesse Aaron Evis, I'm CEO of, uh, of Inlink Midstream. Uh, so I've started my career in the finance world. Uh, spent the last 20 years uh, with Kinder Morgan as president of their CO2 division for the last decade or so. A couple years ago, I was approached by the board to start the Energy Transition Venture Group. Uh, we started the Renewable Natural Gas Company for Kinder, uh, made two acquisitions before I left. They've subsequently made more. Uh, so uh, just getting involved in the CO2 space for the last 20 years, it was a natural fit for me to join Inlink. And, you know, Inlink is an integrated uh, midstream company, so we, you know, process, transport, uh, gather, uh, all, all the uh, value chain products. So we have operations in Oklahoma, the Permian Basin, North Texas, and then we also have a downstream business in Louisiana. So what we're very excited about is the ability, as, as Robin has said, to participate in, in the CCS value chain. You know, we operate along the Mississippi River, and there's 80 million metric tons of emissions along the, the Mississippi River corridor. Of that, you know, Inveris came out with a independent study that said 50 million metric tons is economic, sub $50. So we feel very well positioned. You know, I, I always tell people it's a trifecta. It's, it's high concentration of emissions. It's close proximity to ge geologic sequestration. And then we're just fortunate to have infrastructure in the ground today. So a lot of what we'll talk about today is the need for additional infrastructure. Uh, Louisiana is a very unique uh, situation that has the three uh, pillars that you need to be successful, but a lot of the concentration of, in the, uh, of emissions in the U.S. are very infrastructure poor. So I think, you know, when we talk about the need for infrastructure, uh, you know, especially as we transition and we participate in the uh, decarbonization of industry, I think those are going to be the important things to, to fully appreciate. Thank you. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with that. So um, I feel like we're having some mic trouble, but uh, um, so okay. So let's get into more of the specific questions um, uh, that I think will be interesting. And, I'm, and Jesse, I want to start with you and kind of follow up on what you just said. But I, m maybe um, if you could start on this topic, and then you know, would love to hear Robin and Matt your perspective as well. But like, if we you know, taking a step back, what's your general perspective of the energy macro landscape today? And, and how is not only on CCUS, but also natural gas and LNG and all that, how is Inlink trying to take advantage of that and what's your kind of strategy going forward? So it's very interesting. I would say uh, dynamic is, is what, what we have in, in commodity uh, prices. You know, if you look at the last 180 days, you know, natural gas is worth a third of what it was, you know, 180 days ago. Uh, I think the industry understood there's going to be a period of time, probably mid-23 through kind of mid to late 24, until LNG capacity came online. 
Uh, that happened quicker than probably any of us thought it would. Uh, so, you know, when we think about the need for natural gas and the need to decarbonize, uh, if you, you always look at statistics, and over the last two decades, we've had a 90% increase in natural gas production. We have about 12.5% pop U.S. population growth. Uh, GDP has grown 60% over that same period, and yet emissions are down almost 20%, about 18.5%. And I think natural gas is the key decarbonizer there. Most of that's been coal uh, to gas switching. So you can see the unfortunate events in Europe and what happened early last year uh, and the shift from more of an ESG at all costs to energy security has really been an eye opener for the world. And you saw the commodity prices spike on that. I think you're in a, in a world of, you know, the U.S. has abundant resources, and if you were here for this morning's discussion, you can see there are trillions of cubic feet yet to come, 40 years plus uh, of supply. So we're in a great position to continue to, A, uh, be a, it's an economic uh, benefit to the U.S. in having low-cost feedstock. So the industrial community will, will benefit. Uh, that adds jobs to the economy. Uh, but the reality is, you know, today we're sitting in very low uh, natural gas prices because we have a lack of infrastructure. And that LNG comes online. You know, we have, uh, at Inleak specifically, we invested in the Matterhorn Express pipeline to get more gas from the Permian to the water. I think those, those projects are critical, but uh, there's been about 20 BCF of LNG demand. It's pre-FID, but that's where we sit today. There's not the infrastructure to feed those projects. But I think if you want to be a, a, a good steward of the environment, natural gas is clearly going to be the quickest way to decarbonize. Uh, if you want to be a good steward to your allies and provide world security, then we have to export more LNG. So we're investing along those lines. You know, it's going to be a rough kind of 18-month period. But I think we're, we're very bullish long-term on natural gas prices. I'll, I'll jump in adding my, uh, putting on my sustainability hat. So in addition to building out our low carbon business, I oversee all things ESG for Talos. Um, and I think, you know, I think sustainability is really about strategy. Uh, Jesse and I were just talking right before the panel about all of the uses uh, of all these industrials along the Gulf Coast. And when we say we're building out projects, it's really to decarbonize the large industrial corridors and regions. But it's it's beyond just petrochemicals and power. It's, it's plastics, it's steel, it's cement, it's ammonia, which goes into fertilizers, into our food supply. So it's, you know, that's how I think about it as a macro. And we're seeing that globally it's been decided that uh, CO2 is an issue. We need to decarbonize. And so everyone's got to think about that. You know, you're starting to see um, carbon notifications on your on the glass of water I had this morning, the the cup, the metal cup from the hotel, and um, on many of your products, you can go out and buy on Amazon. It has its carbon footprint. So it's becoming a very global thing. And so we can extend the life of a lot of these industries and also help enable and create new industries. But it takes kind of the theme of this panel: a lot of new infrastructure, new investment. Um, so all these different uh, pieces have to be put in place in order to get these things investable and across the finish line into first operation, injection, throughput, whatever it might be. Yep. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add on the power conversation, you know, the efficiencies of a natural gas power plant from an emission standpoint is about 40 to 60 percent better than a coal-fired plant. And so I, I agree fully with Jesse that natural gas can continue to displace coal and have a real positive effect on emissions. And I, I agree fully that we need more investment in a lot of different areas, and renewables and clean energy are certainly part of that, and carbon capture and sequestration is a huge part of that as well. But I think as we're doing that, if we're tackling climate change issues on a global level, you've got to be willing to go pick up low-hanging fruit as well. And so I think just the ability to... Uh, displace that coal is going to have a massive effect. I mean, it's, it's the same ratio, essentially, of displacing a combustion engine with an electric car, uh, which is something I think a lot of the industry and market has gotten behind. Uh, but this is just on a much larger scale that you're able to do that. But to Jesse's point, that more infrastructure is needed to be able to do that safely, reliably, environmentally responsibly, not just here like we've had some success doing, but globally as well. 
Yeah, uh, there we go. I, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and, and I, you know, I think that that is uh, something I think is lost on the, just the, the, the general populace of, of how complex and how important the infrastructure build out needs to be to kind of deliver energy to have the lights on consistently and all that. Um, and so let, let, let's talk a little bit about how you all do that. So, um, and I guess this is more for uh, Jesse and Matt, um, but there's two real ways that you can uh, deliver gas and or build the infrastructure necessary to move gas around the country. One is to build new infrastructure, and the other is we have thousands and thousands of miles of pipeline that exist today you know, you can repurpose that existing infrastructure. Both of you all are doing that for various purposes, some for gas and some for, for CO2 sequestration. So maybe, Matt, talk about what you all are doing at Producers, yeah. and then Jesse, I want to hear about what you all are doing at Emily. For sure. Thank you, Stephen. And we've been lucky to do a little bit of both. Our uh, current entity started around a greenfield development around the area we're talking about, this kind of robust growth area in the Strawn Sands, uh, but pretty quickly after starting up, we had a line of sight on some looming capacity strains because of the growth in the area. And, and that capacity constraint, in our view, kind of mirrored the Permian at large in terms of the available takeaway that was coming in the Permian as production continued to ramp. Uh, and so we looked at a number of options and eventually found an asset that was much larger than ours in the Anadarko that we could buy that had a pipeline that had really been underutilized for decades at that point in time. Uh, and so, you know, we cleaned it up and put it in good working shape and bought that and combined the two together and repurposed that pipeline, that long haul pipeline that connects the two, initially just to give our own project and our own operating area more takeaway capacity. However, there was so much synergy and capital efficiency in that project that uh, we noticed the Permian's problems had continued to worsen uh, and still exists today. Uh, certainly Matterhorn and pipelines like that are going to have a big impact, but they take a long time to develop. And as soon as you get them there, there's probably another line of pipelines behind that that's needed immediately after. And so we are working on some projects right now to use that pipeline we repurposed to be able to provide uh, some additional leaf relief for some of the bottlenecked volumes that are there in the Permian and, and really need to get to a home. Uh, namely, you've got to clear up enough space to provide cheap, reliable energy for different regions in the country, and then eventually for all of the LNG plants that Jesse was talking to. Uh, and so, you know, that's one of many stories. I'm sure Inlink has done that many times before, but just a great example of a, a pipeline not really doing much of anything or providing any value that we can repurpose without having any additional construction to start providing relief for constrained volumes and giving them a home elsewhere in the country. So uh, I, I agree. Uh, there's going to be limited opportunities for large-scale projects. You know, the, the project that we're the most proud of, and it's a landmark deal. Uh, like Robin, it's a first of its kind. It's uh, an agreement we signed um, third quarter last year with ExxonMobil uh, to transport up to 10 million metric tons out of that Mississippi River corridor across the state to Pecan Island, which is their uh, sequestration site. So we're working with Talus and others on similar projects, but the uniqueness of our ability to repurpose is we, there are four uh, downstream markets in Louisiana. Of those four, InLink owns and operates two of those. So it's a unique position where we have multiple ways to service the industrial user with natural gas, but since we have two systems, a very large diameter pipe, uh, 36 inch plus, you know, we're able to repurpose one of those connections and why we deliver uh, the feedstock to run their industrial processes, the other one is going to take the CO2 away that they are capturing and ultimately into projects like the Exxon Mobil, like Talus's projects. So, you know, the uniqueness of, or really the evolution of this space was, you know, and, and I know we'll talk about IRA in, in a bit, but, you know, the ESG component, uh, I think you finally had the motivations and the financial incentives with IRA for the industrial emitters to take care of their own problem. Uh, that then brought in the guys who've been sequestering CO2 for five decades. So, uh, 
you know, the, the industry, uh, back to the policy panel, this is not new. Uh, the industry has been sequestering CO2 since 1972 in the United States. So uh, been doing it in a big way for a long, long time. Uh, so, you know, the geologic understanding, the ability to keep those, uh, those molecules in the ground is very well established. There are very well established tools to surveil those. So, you know, it, from the risk component, I think that's the, the lowest risk proposition. Uh, really, the higher risk are the technologies on the capture and then the ability to repurpose or to lay a new pipeline. So, you know, we're going to need a lot of help on, on the, from a regulatory permitting side to do that. Uh, we're, we're in a very fortunate position to have the high concentration, again, with the pipe in the ground and, the, and nearby sequestration. But the reality is a lot of these high emission concentration regions are not near geologic sites or historical geologic sites. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we're going to need a lot of permitting uh, assistance. And, you know, it's going to be a campaign on educating people on, you know, the, the, uh, the benefit to decarbonizing, uh, the minimum impact to the environment uh, as we lay these lines, but the ultimate greater good. So I think a lot of, lot of people are concerned about it being nascent and not understanding it, that we got to do a better job of that. Uh, but I think clearly this is uh, the near-term opportunity is CCS uh, to have a big impact. So uh, continue to work on those. That, that's a uh, it's a perfect segue. We obviously heard from uh, Commissioner Craddock and uh, Dr. Burgess earlier uh, about some of the legislation that's been passed to date. Um, and Robin, you're intimately familiar with this, and so I would love uh, to get your perspective on the Inflation Reduction Act, how that's been helpful in a lot of ways to d advance a lot of these projects, but what else we can be doing better, uh, or they, you know, the uh, federal government can be doing better to, to kind of help advance some of these projects. Yeah, sure. So just to, to frame things up, you know, there's different jurisdictions around the world. Some have a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. Um, we've actually had a legacy incentive for, for quite some time. The This 45Q part of the IRS tax code has gone back several administrations. Um, this most recent, um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, was an additional expansion to the credit itself. So now it went from $50 a ton of CO2 to $85 per ton that is stored um, in geologic um, formations for, for permanent sequestration. And so that's very exciting because that really helps enable these projects um, to kind of get over that, that, uh, that initial hurdle and that hump. And so we're partnering with those industrials that are un trying to understand and, and going through their feed studies to better, uh, to better cost out what that capture will be, which is largely, in most cases, the largest expense when you look across the value chain. You know, next is the transport piece. So it's important, as Jesse said, to, to identify these storage locations that are very close to the emission sources so you're not having to take it very far or you really need to do it at scale. And I think that that'll play out over time, and we'll certainly see that. There's been some announcements of some very large pipes, multi-state pipes in the Midwest and the ethanol corridor there where the cost of capture is a little more reasonable. So uh, I think we'll see some of those, those projects move ahead if, as long as they can get all of their, the right-of-way and all the other permitting that ta that's necessary to get all of those um, into service. Uh, but what was really interesting about IRA, it, it extended – or it, it enhanced the incentive, extended the life of it, and um, allowed for some direct pay for those who may or not may not be in a tax paying situation in any given financial year. So it's, it's really helping to breathe new life into this. And so what we've seen is, again, a lot of those, our, our new customer base, these industrials, are now moving into really those feed studies and understanding their cost. And so we're hoping to get some of those volumes subscribed to underwrite all of these projects just because there's multiple steps there. Um, so it's, it's, it's been very encouraging. It's glad to have that support. But I think probably leading into our next conversation, which, again, Commissioner Craddock talked about a lot, is, you know, what's, what's slowing us down? And, you know, it could be permitting, um, whether it's for the, the Class 6, these, the, the permits to permanently sequester CO2. Um, and if and if the states take over on that and we can expedite that timeline, then it might just be all the work and permitting if, if you are talking about brand new infrastructure. So that's where if you've got a strategic partner in an area that has a, a footprint that, that works and you can repurpose some of that, that's great. That's a great starting point. Uh, we, we've got to be low cost um, because we recognize it's, it's very costly when you add up all the different value chain pieces. 
Yeah, look, you're going to hear it from me. You're going to hear it from everybody up here. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a little, uh, and I'll be more blunt about it, it's a little, it can be frustrating at times when the Inflation Reduction Act is passed and, you know, you're hearing it from all these panelists that we have the ability, the technology, the history, the expertise to go effectuate on carbon capture and sequestration, yet it's very, very difficult to go get permits. And, uh, and so you're seeing companies like Talos, like InLink, I mean, Talos is leasing land from, from the Texas GLO uh, with the expectation that ultimately the federal government and the EPA and uh, either issues permits or Texas wins, prim you know, achieves primacy over time and is able to do that. Um, so just real quick, you know, on that front, you know, um, we talked a little bit about Texas and Commissioner Craddock, I guess, and we haven't talked about, uh, we didn't talk about this before, but um, in, in Louisiana, do you have any sense for timing of primacy? Is that still kind of up in the air, or how do you and Jesse think about that? I mean, yeah, as, as recently as last week, uh, they the the EPA made an announcement that it will go into the federal registry for comments uh, in May. So that is progressing. Uh, I think that's very welcome news because uh, prior to last week, it was anybody's guess. But I think Louisiana is a little ahead of Texas. Uh, hopefully, you know, this will, uh, you know, not be a pro protracted uh, comment period. Uh, but I think there's a lot of interest in Louisiana. So there, I, I don't expect it to happen overnight. But the, the, the nice thing is we do have a date for the initial publications. Yeah, I'll just say we, we continue to see the pressure. I think that's where most of the permits have been filed. Um, none um, have gone through yet in, in Louisiana. So I know the state's hoping to, to get that. Um, but I'm optimistic if, if you know all the states that go out and seek primacy for the class six can achieve it, that they can um, expedite that timeline. We've seen it demonstrated with North Dakota that early last year said, hey, now that we've got this, we, we were shooting for a 12-month turnaround. And late last year, or even last fall, I think they announced they, they pushed one through in less than five months, So, which is a lot more reasonable. So we're, we're excited about it. We heard about all the, the resources and the skill sets that you've got already in-house at the, the state agencies that already administrate mm -hmm. CO2 wells, inject, injection wells, acid gas wells. So they you know, they've got the technical staff and, and just the additional resources to do it in a timely manner. So we'll get off of uh, uh, permitting for a second. I know that's a, uh, I'm a, I'm, I have a spirited perspective on that. But, um, you know, is, is there anything else from, from y'all's mind, uh, y'all's perspective on, uh, you know, anything that else that needs to change with regards to the legislation? I know before the IRA was passed, um, you know, you can make the argument that a lot of CCUS projects were not economic at $50 a ton, particularly when, uh, and this is getting into some of the minutia uh, uh, of the legislation, but uh, particularly when um, it was a tax equity, it was kind of a tax credit as opposed to actually receiving revenue. Now we've switched, the IRA has been passed, it's switched to $85 a ton, and the first five years are direct pay, as in the government, you know, pays you for the CO2 you, you sequester. Huge step forward in advancing the ball, as, as Robin kind of mentioned. But is there anything else in the legislation that, or that was not included, or anything else in your mind outside of permitting, uh, I guess, pipeline infrastructure and, and wells that, that needs to change? Or do you feel like the industry is kind of poised and ready to go execute on all this outside of kind of getting through some of the loopholes with the, with the government? You know, I'll have a few comments. Um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, in order to get a lot of these clean energy credits, there were certain either domestic content uh, requirements, there was a prevailing wage, and an apprenticeship program. So again, as you're trying to, to compromise and come up with some, some good uh, legislation, it makes a lot of sense to try to infuse some more of those jobs here in the U.S., uh, which sounds great, but now we're trying to figure out how we're going to ensure our contract, subcontract, some contractors have the apprenticeship programs in place as we're trying to reattract some more of these uh, these trades back into some of these jobs. I mean, just getting welders right now that have gone through an appropriate apprenticeship is somewhat challenging. So we're having to rebuild some of that. So that's important. On the legislation piece, uh, what I what's actually was in the. Uh, state legislature this week was um, some more definition on kind of who owns the poor space here in Texas is a little more defined in Louisiana. 
Um, but making sure that that's a little more black and white and not gray before we really move ahead on these projects will be very important. So, I, you know, getting some more definition around how all of this will work, how, how this is all going to get filed with the IRS to, to claim these incentives and how some of these, um, these projects will move ahead. The implementation piece is real, making sure we all understand what kind of documentation is going to be required. Um, and just get some clarification up front. I think that'll give everyone, is, again, we want to we wanna build out projects that are financeable, which means you got to have some boundaries and definition on, on how it all will work. Yeah, the only thing I'd add there is, you know, the last time there were revisions to 45Q, it took the IRS three years to publish the regs. So I think the, the clarity around the complexity around the compliance and the monetization of that credit, I think there's still some work to do there. Uh, you know, how do you how do you certify your your labor force? How do you you know, I, I think there's there's certain provisions in there that are that made the 45 Q a little bit more complex. And I think in order to FID, I think companies are going to have to understand how they monetize that credit. And I think that's in the works. So that's probably the last thing we need to get the clarity around it. Uh, the other thing I'd say is the addressable market in total. One thing we haven't said that, it, you know, the threshold was 100,000 tons per annum. Now that's been moved to 10. So I think there's a lot more of your smaller emitters that can now participate. So the addressable, the size of the market's gotten bigger. That also brings in opportunities for uh, Matt and I as processors to be able to get some rural, more rural uh, industrial emitters that we can, you know, do class two injection in Texas today. So uh, I think it's it, it, there's there's a lot of positive that's come out of there. I think there's just a few details that we've got to iron out. Yep, that makes total sense. Um, so uh, let's, we'll, we'll maybe move off of CCUS for, for a minute. We may come back to that. But um, I want to talk about uh, one other thing around um, just kind of sustainability and uh, emissions reduction. CCUS is a big part of it. But are, are there other ways that each one of your companies are kind of looking at to, to decarbonize your business? Are there certain things, if it's, you know, switching fuels or, you know, um, uh, you know, you all talk about it, but just that you all are focused on that you can, that we can go paint to the market and say, look, we're doing this cleaner and better and more efficient than anywhere in the world, and here's how we're doing it. I don't, Matt, why don't you start? And then yeah, absolutely. I mean, our line of business on GNP is a very important element of reducing emissions out in oil and gas fields to begin with. And so when we started this current project, I think around that time, 2018, 2019, routine flaring, overall flaring in the Permian had both peaked. And, and certainly this area we moved into was a part of that. I think when we got our system up and running, there was above... 2 million, 10 million cubic feet a day that was being flared, uh, largely because those gas volumes had nowhere else to go. And so when we go build out infrastructure, and Jesse does this on a much larger scale than we do, but our infrastructure is helpful on getting those volumes down to and in market and providing them for use instead of having that flaring go. And I think there's been a big push for that over the last few years. And you have seen flaring uh, in those areas come down fairly significantly. Uh, aside from just doing that as our business line, we certainly pay very close attention to our operations as we march forward, and you're kind of always chasing the next largest target. Uh, so recent successes, they're, they're largely uh, technology-driven for the most part on my side of the fence. Uh, so we, advanced, we installed a more advanced nitrogen treating plant at our main facility, and that lowered our plant emissions by over 90%. Um, that's not off of a very big number, but it was a really big impact. Uh, similarly, put together uh, a fairly bespoke closed-loop system we designed for our compressor stations to take the remaining tank vapors down over 95%. Uh, and so there's, you know, been projects that we, every time one comes up, we find a new source of emission. We're always also advancing how we monitor and what we monitor with and how frequently we monitor. Uh, you run across those things and generally look for some type of technology to go and better that. Uh, and as we chase forward, those targets are going to get smaller and smaller, uh, but that's not to say you don't continue to advance the way you're looking for them and, and how you go about them. And so that's uh, very typical of a company my size, but the feedback we get from the larger companies in our space uh, if we're ever going to be an attractive target for them is that we have to have those things in place because those have been on the forefront for the larger companies for a long time here as well. But And, and that's also, I mean, in y'all's business, that's 
potential revenue too, right? I mean, Absolutely. It is for the gathering and processing businesses like ours. It is for the ENPs that are drilling this to begin with. Now, a lot of times, especially earlier on, I think there has been a, a shift in mindset about how we go approach areas as an industry now, and I think that's good. I think that's very much needed, uh, and I'm glad we've gotten to this point, and we need to go further. Uh, but a lot of these plays don't go out to focus on natural gas. They could be crude-based or, or have some other commodity that they're chasing, and so it becomes a bit of an afterthought. And so if you're poor on your planning and you're going to go after a program without any forethought on what you need to do with this gas, uh, the old philosophy was, well, just burn it and put it in the sky. And I think we've tried to get away with that. Uh, but to a lot of the conversations we've had all day today, investment is needed. There has to be capital available for companies like mine or companies like Jesse to go find those areas that have new development and be able to physically build out this infrastructure because it takes a long time. It's very expensive to do so. Now, the net benefit is that can be monetized. It can be monetized for my company. It can be monetized for the companies that are drilling it. Uh, but you've got to have the infrastructure in place in order to do that. And, and without it, it's uh, wasting money and it's environmentally irresponsible. Go I'll add, um, you know, offshore, particularly as you move into deep water, kind of naturally boasts um, a lower CI or carbon intensity just from the nature of your aggregating large volumes to a singular platform. Um, and so that's, that's good news for us. But then even with that, we, we have set and reset um, some emissions reductions targets. We had a greenhouse gas, which includes both methane and CO2. Uh, or for our scope one, so directly related to our operations, reduction target from a 18 baseline by 25 of, of originally 25%, we restretched it to 30. And with the addition of these additional, and the invent assets I mentioned earlier, we've, we've basically hit that, that goal early. So now we're gonna have to re-baseline and, and, you know, and re-understand <laughs> when you bring That's in good. new assets, then you have to make sure yeah, you have a consistent way of measuring and recording all of those emissions. Um, and we'll set a new a new target. Um, but you know, some of the things it's interesting. Some of the challenges offshore is, uh, you know, we can use these these FLIR cameras, this infrared, where you can look for methane leaks or hot spots, and that's great. Um, still facing some challenges on continuous monitoring when you think about the offshore facilities and the d various decks and layers of where the where the um, the equipment is is spaced out. It's it's harder to do that. Um, so I think with some additional technology, we'll see some of those um, um, get tried and, you know, we're happy to be some guinea pigs and go test out some of that so we can continue to improve that. And that's, that's part of who we are. Again, we're that second owner of, of assets as the majors maybe shed some of their tier two. We, we, can, we can take those assets, uh, be good stewards of them environmentally and also look for additional resources, but you got to do it in a ever cleaner manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is, you know, as an industry, we've been doing a lot of these things for many years. I mean, there's a greater emphasis on, you know, vapor recovery units, uh, low, high to low bleed uh, valves. There's, uh, you know, you, you can, we, we've been doing a lot of this uh, mitigation and emission reduction work for years. Uh, in our business with 45Q on a smaller scale, we've been able to develop projects like the one we announced uh, last year with BKV, which is about a half of half a million metric tons a year, so smaller in nature, but that's taking, you know, central facilities in the field. Uh, you know, we're starting with a class two well today, converting that to six. So you will be able to monetize some of these opportunities. But, you know, again, we're all very, very focused on, you know, decarbonizing our own footprints. Like I said, it makes us more attractive. We've got, you know, as a public in, uh, investor, uh, you know, they're, they're asking those questions, you know, what are we doing, uh, you know, flare reduction, and, and, you know, the whole industry is highly focused, and there, there are ways to get there. Uh, you know, fortunately, IRA is providing some economic ways to get there, uh, so uh, we're very excited about those opportunities. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I, you know, I don't want to speak for, for you all, but one of the things that I'm hopeful that the students in the audience can take away from this is that uh, as an industry, one, I think we've done an incredibly poor job of advertising and marketing the value that, that the energy industry brings to um, the community writ large across the globe um, and how important it is as an industry. But I think what you're hearing amongst these panelists is that, you know, they're doing, we're doing incredibly well as it relates to emissions reduction, finding unique ways to tackle that and I think the 
uh, energy industry itself is going to be the pioneer and the leader in doing that. And so my, that's, that's my hope is that there's a lot of noise on the um, other side of the aisle or whatever you want to call it that just uh, paints that in a bad light. And I just want to give my two cents that I, I commend you all for, for doing everything you are doing because I, I just think it's critically uh, important. And it's important for everybody here to know that. Um, so uh, now that I've gotten off my soapbox, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, LNG for a minute. So um, we've had a huge expansion on LNG uh, you know, domestically in the U.S. It's been an incredible um, source of supply for the globe. I, I would love, Jesse, maybe we could start with you. Just talk how that has changed your business model, changed how you're thinking about investing going forward. Um, you, know, you, you spoke about it a, a little bit earlier, but I mean, where do you kind of see that industry, uh, you know, the LNG industry going over the next five, ten years? And then, you know, uh, Robin, I'd be curious to hear about Talis's perspective about that as well, and obviously Matt. So. Yeah, like I said earlier, I mean, we're very bullish long-term natural gas prices. Uh, so the commodity, we feel, will be elevated for the next decade as the demand continues to grow uh, globally. And, you know, if you were in for uh, Dr. Tinker's speech, you, you saw the, the, the need, the great need. Uh, Europe is uh, unlikely to, regardless of how this ends and if it ends soon, I think they are highly focused on diversifying their supply. And I think rightfully so, we need to be in a position to help them do that. So I think, you know, from our perspective, you know, we operate assets. We're the largest uh, gas gathering processor in North Texas. Uh, and, you know, the, the Barnett has is, is long been uh, on a decline. You know, we feel like if you looked at the, the charts he put up earlier, we have, we have a high conviction, conviction that we're not going to get new pipes, you know, coming out of the northeast. So with the demand coming on on the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast, you know, where's that supply going to come from? You know, obviously there's connectivity that can get you from North Texas, Oklahoma. Obviously the Haynesville's been the most impactful to date, but it, it's going to do so much. So, you know, we're, we're believers. Uh, we, we've made two acquisitions in the last uh, six months, uh, one in North Texas, one in, in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, we believe long term those, those basins will play a larger role to fill the LNG uh, demand. Uh, obviously, the Permian is going to continue to do that, but you know we're well positioned in, in those three basins. So we're 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 very focused on those investments upstream. And as I spoke, we have two of the market systems in Louisiana, so we are extremely bullish and focused on growing. You know, we've gone from not being involved in LNG uh, two years ago to about 10% of our EBITDA is, is there. We forecast by the end of 2024, about a quarter of our business will be LNG. So significant growth for our company. And, you know, we're highly focused on, you know, uh, capturing those opportunities. I'll, I'll frame it a slightly different way. Um, as we talked about earlier, I, I, I agree that natural gas is, has a major role to play kind of throughout a transition, evolution, transformation, pick your favorite word there. Um, but I also think, you know, just looking at what happened last, last winter, going into spring, geopolitically, and the, the startup, the restart up of some coal plants in Europe, uh, just making sure we've got decarbonization there too. I mean, we've, we've seen that. Again, this is proven technology. Petronova just started back up here in Texas, where you've got carbon capture on a, on a coal facility. Um, but the natural gas cycle is very interesting, and we're excited about not just helping decarbonize that. We're doing that with one of our four projects. Our customer is Freeport LNG. Uh, they were a swing supplier in, in, in that market last year until they, they were down and now coming back online, thankfully. But, you know, really moving the needle there um, globally. You know, the other thing is, is this you've probably heard blue hydrogen and blue ammonia where you're using the natural gas there and you can decarbonize to create these new these new fuels and so we want to be the enabler for these new fuels too and i think that natural gas has a role to play in that as well so it's i think there's a lot of opportunity i'm a we need everything um, all of the above believer when it comes to energy sources and supplies um, but there's ways we can do it ever cleaner and, and more decarbonize and have these blue or circular economies help them develop. Yep. Yeah, I'll get to uh, LNG in a minute, but that brings up a really good point on hydrogen. We've got a company nearby that is installing a hydrogen facility. I can't tell if this is working or not, but we'll keep going anyway. And, and it is funny how it, 
much interaction there is between us. So there's a lot of wind and solar being installed, and that's providing great power for both their plant and ours. They need some of our natural gas. We'll take some of their carbon away from them to try and sequester it, and they'll power us throughout the day, and then we'll have our natural gas powering generators to power the two facilities at night. And, and there's just a lot of interaction, interplay between these new technologies and what we have existing that can help each other. And then you get to a more safer, more reliable energy source faster by combining those processes than you do by trying to go them alone. Uh, LNG, I mean, we've talked a lot about it today, and Jesse's talked about some of that growth. And, and you guys have a great slide from your presentation last month on just how much that is going to grow over the next five to ten years. Uh, but I agree completely. We've got to get the feedstock for those LNG plants, which is residue gas, from the areas. There are low-hanging fruit that Jesse mentioned, but there are other areas that are core development areas that we've got to be able to get those resources to where they're needed. And then from there, you've got to get that LNG to other parts of the world where it's needed. Because if you look at developing newly industrialized countries, uh, China also fits in that group. If you look at where they're going from an emission standpoint relative to where the United States has the last 20 years, we're headed in opposite directions. And a lot of that is because of the source of power, right? If they don't have an abundant resource for cheap, reliable power, they're going to take whatever abundant resource they do have for reliable power, and it might not always be as environmentally friendly. I think China, I read, permitted uh, the equivalent of about two new coal-fired plants per week last year in all the tumultuous uh, political behavior we had going on. And other countries around them in other parts of the world that don't have the resources that we have in Texas, I mean, I think we lead uh, the world in new wind and new solar technology that we're installing here in the state. But we've got a bunch of resources and an abundant source of natural gas that allows us to do that. And I, uh, the hope is that this LNG allows us to flood the world market with this bridge fuel while we continue to go invest more in other renewable technologies. But I think the burden falls on the countries that have the resources to do that. And at the same time, we've got to take the resources that we have that have allowed us to decrease emissions the way we have over the last two decades and provide those to countries that don't. Because if the option is being in the dark or firing up a coal plant, they're going to fire up a coal plant. And I think there is a, a real mission for natural gas. It, it might not be the perfect forever solution, but it's a heck of a lot better, 40 to 60 percent better than what's being used right now. And so that was what I was mentioning earlier. Like, we've got to go tackle low-hanging fruit globally wherever we can. And, and I think the immense amount of LNG plants that are coming on are going to play a huge role in that. And now it's up to us and our investment community on the midstream side to make sure we get the natural gas from where it's being produced down to those areas where we're going to liquefy it. Uh, totally agree with all of that. Um, so that, that look, this kind of concludes the questions that I had. I, I thought that was uh, incredibly insightful, and hopefully that gives everybody kind of at least a smattering of, of uh, all the various things that these great companies are doing uh, to kind of further um, further the, the, the global community. So um, thank you all for, for participating.